Amen. Good morning, church. I hope that you have a Bible, and I hope that you will keep it open there to the Gospel of Mark in the fourth chapter as we go to the Scriptures together. It's such a wonderful day, beautiful sunshine, wonderful to uh, sing praises to God. We've been led so well by Brother Matt and Brother Peter. I appreciate Brother Creed's words at the table as we remember Jesus Christ who died for us on this the Lord's day because he rose on the first day of the week. And so we might come to him boldly in prayer as we've been led by Brother Tim and Brother Matt. It's been good to worship together this morning and I'm glad we are here. Uh, Also just real quickly if I could say thank you to the congregation on behalf of my family and my mother. Uh, She suffered a heart attack last Saturday but thank you so much for your prayers and encouragement. She's at home recovering and doing very well and she just wanted me to say how touched she was by the love and support that came from this congregation. Thank you all so much, brethren. God bless you all. I appreciate Brother Prayton leading, reading to us Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. As we see here, a great, great storm had come on to the Sea of Galilee as Jesus and his disciples were sailing across it of an evening. And here the Lord calms the storm. This is one of those accounts that the Bible is famous for. As Jesus exercised authority over the winds and the waves, Jesus stills the storm. And how is it that this storm came about in the fashion that it did? If I could just say a word about the topography of the Sea of Galilee. Can you picture in your mind, imagine in your mind, a punch bowl. That is basically the topography of the Sea of Galilee. It is a great lake, but it is surrounded all around by cliffs and mountains. And, and when you travel there, you'll be on a tour bus. And as they drive you from where you are down to the coast, your ears will pop. It is a sudden, sudden change in elevation. And what happens then is great winds going across the mountains and down through the crags and ravines. They can hit that water and, and they blow across it quickly. There's great speed and it stirs up the waters and they can become very, very choppy. Now, to stir up this... Uh, water and it, 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 it becomes choppy and I want you to exp- appreciate with me how Jesus is sailing this night and he is sailing with experienced fishermen and these are the kind of fishermen that can handle a little bit of weather these are the kind of fishermen that they don't mind going out at night because they'll go on the water and they'll fish all night long but what happens is this storm quickly develops into more than a little choppy water. What you see going on is the boat is being pounded by waves. That the waves are crushing in and the boat is already filling up with water. And these lifelong fishermen come to a conclusion, we're perishing. This could be it. This storm, this night, at this moment, this is how we might die. And so they come to Jesus and they rouse him from his sleep. And what does he do? He rebukes the wind and the waves. He literally stands up and calls out to the sky, be quiet, stop it, be still. Wow. And the response is immediate. I don't want us to miss that. What Mark doesn't describe is that Jesus is yelling for 20 or 30 minutes at the weather. Finally, it kind of blows over. The storm has passed and they're still floating. That's not what Mark says happened. What Mark says happened is that he says these words and suddenly, immediately, the wind cease. The waves are stilled. There are no more waves. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine from going through a hurricane force gale and in the blink of an eye, the doldrums? Imagine with me being in the boat with the apostles. And here they are, sopping wet. Water's dripping off of them. And then one of them's clutching an oar. And some other's been hanging on to some rigging for dear life. Still another has a bucket because he'd been trying to bail a little bit of water out. And, and, and now they're just standing there, soaked, and there is no storm. And they look at one another. And they look at Jesus. And it says they're afraid. Who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? Well, it is one of these incredible examples of the power of Jesus Christ. And evidence that he is who he says he is. The son of God. The Messiah. The creator for creation obeys his word. He has power over earthly elements. But it occurs to me as I'm reading through this text. That these apostles, these disciples. They only experience this storm. 
because they obeyed Jesus. If you noticed in chapter 4 and verse 35, on the same day when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. Other little boats also with him. Whose idea was it to cross the sea that night? It was Jesus' idea. Ever thought about that? If they had procrastinated a little bit and said, you know, it is late, it is evening. Why don't we just camp on the shore tonight? We, we can sail out first light if you want. They would have missed the storm. If they had disobeyed Jesus and said, you want to sail? No, we're walking. We're going to walk around to the other side. We, we can do that. It's not that big of a walk. They would have missed the storm. But because they were obedient to the Lord that night and they got in the boat, they go right into a storm. They thought for sure they were going to die in that storm. The storm they encountered because they followed Jesus. What happens when you follow Jesus and find a storm? Here are these disciples who are doing their best to obey Christ and it leads them to a storm, a terrifying one. And there are times when we are trying to follow Jesus and obey him. And so doing, we experience a storm. Well, what then? And I believe this text gives us some really good teaching and instruction for those kinds of moments and times in our discipleship. The first is a question. Number one, how far do you trust Jesus? How far do you trust Jesus? Isn't it easy to trust Jesus when there's nice weather out and he asks you to do something that you like to do anyway? For instance, it's a lovely evening and you say to a bunch of fishermen, let's go sailing. Sounds good. We should do that. Very easy to obey. We like that. When the master wants to go to the other side, that's no big deal at all. Sure, let's follow the master. Let's go to the other side. Let's give him a ride. Let's get the other boats. They're obeying Jesus. It's Jesus' desire to travel. Jesus' will to sail to the other side. Sailing is in the comfort zone. It's a nice day to sail until it's not. And that's verse 37. Verse 37 of our text says, And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it was already filling. How far did they trust Jesus? And at that moment, there's a realization. We are trusting Jesus with our lives. When we decided to follow him, and even into this travel, we are trusting him with our lives. And it means no less for you and I today. I'll tell you that at this evening and in this text, the apostles took a big step in their spiritual growth. They really shifted from being observers to the great works of Jesus and witnesses to Jesus' power of saving others. Witnesses to Jesus' ability to help others in need to being the people who were immediately in need. To being the people who understood, I need to be saved. They need to be saved themselves. And we just mentioned how this was a miracle. It was a sign of his power and it attested to Jesus' identity. But there's a difference for the people who are in the storm. Up till now, these apostles, these disciples, they had only ever witnessed, do Jesus, uh, witnessed Jesus doing things for other people, to benefit other people. They hadn't been in the position of needing him, per se, themselves. They were standing next to him, and they wanted to aid him in helping others who had some real needs, but now they're the ones in need. Well, what do you mean by that? I mean, you read through the book of Mark, and here's these disciples who had seen Jesus cast demons out of people, but they hadn't been possessed. They were there with him. And they had seen Jesus cleanse lepers. But they didn't have leprosy themselves. And they had seen Jesus heal the sick, like Peter's mother-in-law. But they didn't have fevers. They're there with Jesus when he's saving, when he's working, when he's helping. They had seen Jesus heal a paralytic. But these disciples could all walk just fine. Suddenly, they're the ones in peril. While they had been witnesses to Jesus doing amazing things to save others, they had not personally entrusted their life to him yet, their welfare to him yet. Others had trusted Jesus with their life, and now it is the disciples' turn. 
Now it is the apostles' turn. Others had been crying out to Jesus, save me, I'm perishing with this, I'm perishing from that. And now it is the disciples' turn to cry out, don't you care, we are perishing. Lord, we need you to save us. And this is what being a disciple, being a Christian involves. That we follow Jesus and we entrust our lives to him. It's a blessing to be a Christian because we have the opportunity to see Jesus work through his gospel to change people's lives, to save souls. And isn't it wonderful when we see someone else being baptized, becoming a Christian, and we all rejoice in that. That's a great, great thing. But we must never forget that Jesus is our Savior and it is the gospel that saves us, that we too need saving. Christians choose to live lives of faithful obedience to Jesus. And we do that whether it is a pleasant evening, let's go sailing, or whether we're in the midst of a terrible storm. We are faithful unto death. So how far do you trust Jesus? That's what we're taught to be, faithful unto death. So how far do you trust Jesus? Would you trust Jesus with your heart? In the Gospel of Mark, in the 12th chapter, verses 30 and 31, we are taught that we need to love the Lord our God with our heart, soul, mind, strength. He gets all of us. And my friends, when he gets all of us, it shapes our lives and changes the manner in which we live. In 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 12, I think you get a picture of how that heart works itself out in our lives. 1 Timothy 4 verse 12, the scripture says, Let no one despise your youth, But be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Because my heart is there for the Lord, my choice in life and purity would be an example to others of the goodness of the Lord and my faithfulness to his word. I will love what he loves. It will shape my behavior. But then there's a storm. Oh, I'm trying to follow Jesus with my heart and obey him in my life. But suddenly I realize... If I'm going to continue obeying Jesus, I've got a conflict, I don't know, maybe in my livelihood, maybe in my work. You know, I, I think about uh, uh, some of the people who became followers of Jesus we read about in the scriptures, like a Zacchaeus, who, you know, he was a tax collector, and that was a, a career given to cheating people. And what does he say? He said, if I've swindled anybody, I'll restore it fourfold. He's going to be honest in his business, though his business perhaps lent itself to dishonesty. And a Christian today might be looking at their own work and their own vocation and saying, there's a lot of dishonesty in this. There's a lot of cheating and cutting corners, whether it's your idea or whoever it is you're working for. Should I really be a part of that? There were some people who became disciples and followers of Jesus Christ. I I think about the ladies, the the harlots and the prostitutes. Okay, they were involved in a livelihood that is immoral and sinful in the eyes of God. You have to repent. You can't do that anymore. So they're going to be trusting God to provide for them. But they got to change the whole way they live. Perhaps some of us look at our livelihoods and begin to wonder, is my livelihood nothing more but just trading in vice? Encouraging sin or providing sin in some way for other people? I can't continue to do that. I, I need to be faithful to the Lord. We, 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 we want to trust the Lord with all of our heart, with all of our livelihood. Excuse me. With all of our heart, with all of our best. But what if it brings conflicts in the livelihood? Would we trust him to make changes there? That's an example. Will we trust him? How far do you trust him? Will you trust Jesus with your family? Well, in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 and following, there's this beautiful picture of what marriage is. As he teaches us about Christ in the church, he takes the picture, the metaphor of a husband and wife. And then on into the sixth chapter, how Christians are supposed to raise their children up, and the fathers particularly, in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And we say, I believe the word of God, and I want to raise my family to know that. But then we come into a storm. Maybe the storm is that, uh, yeah, I'm a Christian, and my spouse is a Christian, but my spouse isn't loving me like Christ loved the church. My wife isn't respecting me like the church does Christ. And because that is going on in my marriage and my spouse is not being what they want to be, ought to be, does that mean that I'm going to stop being obedient to the word of God? Does that mean I'm going to stop trusting Christ? I say, well, we've just been trying to raise our kids up to, to know the Lord. And then you come into a storm because it's your kids that are asking questions. I'm not sure there's a God. I doubt there's a God. Or your kids are getting into some real kind of trouble, you know, the kind that 
changes the course of their life or involves the police. And you say, I, boy, I just, all I'm trying to do is the right thing and I'll be Jesus and follow Jesus. And here I've, I've come into the storm. Well, will you trust him now or, or do you give up on him now? Do you think maybe he's not who he claimed to be? Maybe the storm shouldn't be going on in my life if he's, if he's really Christ and I'm, I'm following him. Will you trust him in the family? Will you trust and obey his word even in difficult times and storms in the family? Will you trust Jesus Christ with your soul? In Mark chapter 8 and verse 36, Jesus poses a question to the multitudes when he says, What does it profit a man? For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? In John chapter 6, verses 67 through 69, there's an occasion where there are many people who said they were disciples and followers of Jesus. They turned back and they left him because his teachings were hard. To such a degree, he looked around at the twelve and said, are you leaving also? And Peter makes a phenomenal confession at that time when he says, Lord, to whom shall we go? Where will we turn? You have the words of life. And I wonder, I wonder... Do we trust the Lord and trust the Lord all the way with our souls? That there really is no other Savior. There really is no other salvation than the gospel of Jesus Christ. That no matter your earthly achievements or successes, if you do not believe in Jesus, if you do not trust him, if you do not obey his gospel and are baptized into Christ, you will be lost when you die. And every one of us in this room is going to die. Now that may happen in 60 years and you have a good long life and you're full of days. But that may happen next week in a car wreck. And that's a real storm, isn't it? When you come in and meet death. Will you be trusting the Lord then? Will you have been obedient and following his word then? When you cry out and truly need your savior then. Because everything else stays behind. You see, the apostles did learn to trust Jesus with their lives. And they would follow him and they would obey him. And when they faced storms because of it, they would look to Jesus for the way. And as they followed him, they did come into storms. Oh, they came into storms of persecution. Many of them that came to martyrdom. But they trusted Jesus with their lives. And that's what we need to do all of our lives. This doesn't mean that being a Christian, everyone who followed Jesus is going to be called upon to die. But what we need to understand, or for the cause, but following Jesus doesn't mean life without storms. And I would hate for you to be misled. I would hate for you to think that if Jesus is in the boat with you, it's only pleasant evenings and it's only smooth sailing. That's not Christianity. We will have storms, and some of them will be frightening storms. Frightening to us. But number two, Jesus is not afraid of the storm. I see that in Mark 4 as well, that Jesus is not afraid of the storm. What's he doing when waves are crashing into the little boat and it's filling up with water? He's asleep, isn't he? He's asleep on a cushion in the stern in a terrible storm. He's sleeping. Now, with a word, the raging sea calmed in an instant. With a word, he demonstrates his power over creation. And you don't fear the things that you can control. But we certainly can fear. Because as life goes on, we find there are fewer and fewer things that we actually control. Less all the time. But sometimes we enter a storm for no other reason than we have been following Jesus. We are being obedient and doing what is right. And behold, a storm is kicked up and we're afraid. Well, the Bible contemplates that. There are some who are fearful of persecution. In 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 14, 1 Peter 4 and verse 14, the scripture says in that place, if you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you. For the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part he is blasphemed, but on your part he is glorified. Of course we're afraid of persecution. We're being obedient in this word. We're telling people the truth. And what do we get? Well, we're being told, no, what you're saying is hate speech. I'm just trying to preach the Bible about something. No, no, no. You need to be canceled for that. We cannot allow that kind of information to be disseminated among the peoples. Wow. I'm just trying to preach the Bible and encourage people's faith. This is bigotry. This is hate. This is backwards. 
It's kind of slander and persecution for people being honest about what the scripture says. Whether it's about the sin of homosexual behavior or any other kind of sin. We need to say what the scripture says whether the society will receive it or not. And it's not out of any kind of hate or malice. It's only out of love. Because I'm a person that needs to be saved in Christ. And the gospel is for all people that need to be saved in Christ. But in my faithfulness in sharing his good news, there will be persecution. Peter contemplates that. We may fear that. The storm of rejection. In 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 3, this is contemplated. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. Those are people that aren't Christians. They don't know God. When we walked in lewdness, lusts, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In regard to these, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dis- dissipation, speaking evil of you. Peter reminds these Christians, yes, there was life before Christ, and there were these associations and the things you did with them. And some of them were foolishness, and some of them were sinful, but it was all kind of a waste of time. And you've changed. Now you profess Christ. Now you're going to show a different way. And because of that faithfulness, you'll be rejected by your friends. Those old ones that used to run with you, they don't want to run with you anymore. And we don't like the idea of rejection. And we read that passage and we say, well, that sounds like kind of a wild and woolly bunch. Don't you know that we might face rejection from our families for being faithful to Christ? Met people in Tanzania who grew up in their family of origin as Muslims. And when they're baptized and become Christians, they're not welcomed back at home. And perhaps some of you come from families like that, either Muslim or some other religion background. And when you were baptized and became Christians, it really strained the relationship. You didn't have that family anymore. Thankfully, God has given you his family, his church, to meet those needs and lift you up. But in your faithfulness, you came into a storm and there was a great rejection. And rejection is a scary thing. We might be afraid of physical circumstances. What goes along with persecution and rejection in many cultures and many times it is poverty. And this is contemplated in the Bible. How in Luke chapter 9, uh, excuse me, Luke chapter 12 and verses 22 and 23, Jesus is speaking to people who are wondering what will we eat and what clothing will we put on and how does he comfort them? The Lord will provide for you. The Lord will provide for you. Are we worried about what we might lose in a standard of living or a quality of life because we are Christians? We may well fear those things. Or even the storm of death. Jesus isn't afraid of the storm of death. But we can be. In Acts chapter 12 verses 1 and 2 there is the account of the martyrdom of James the Apostle. Why was he incarcerated? Why was he killed? Because he was a Christian. That's it. If he hadn't have been a Christian... Wouldn't have been killed that night. Ever thought about that? And that's a fearful thing. Why does he go into that storm? Because he's faithful to Christ. I say Jesus has no fear of these things because he overcame these things. He himself is the example of overcoming persecution. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21. 1 Peter 2 and verse 21. The scripture says in that place, For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth? Who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return? When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. We've not encountered any persecution that Jesus didn't know and worse, and yet he overcame. So he's not afraid of those things. He has power over those things. He overcame rejection. In Luke chapter 4, verses 28 through 30, his hometown tries to push him off of a cliff. That's rejection. That is not subtle. And how does he overcome that? In the moment, he passes through it. But I will tell you, so that they couldn't push him off a cliff, but I will tell you that there is a greater overcoming. Because when he was lifted up, he drew all men to himself. Because when he was lifted up upon the cross, there was forgiveness and new life and reconciliation offered to all. How does he overcome rejection? By the power of reconciliation. And that is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
he overcame. He overcame the trials of physical circumstances, poverty. In Luke chapter 9 and verse 58, he talks about the foxes have holes. The Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He really practiced this business of the food, the clothing. It's going to come from the Lord. And, and God hasn't failed me because I don't have a lot of economic security. That's a great risk, a great fear to lose economic security. But Jesus overcame this. And certainly we know he overcame the storm of death in the glory of his resurrection. That on the third day, early in the morning on the first day of the week, the tomb was found empty. And he is victorious over death whatever hardship whatever storm we might suffer and suffer for the cause of christ whatever it is you might be going through right now i want to encourage you do not fear it i want you to understand that jesus knows about it that jesus knows what you're going through and he is not afraid jesus has the perspective of the overcomer and we are overcomers in christ Indeed, the scripture teaches us that faith is the victory that overcomes the world. What should we do then in the middle of a fearful storm? Number three, look at Jesus and look at him all the while through that storm. The apostles learned that night to turn to Christ and where else could they turn? In verse 38 of Mark 4, the scripture says, but he was in the stern asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased. And there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? marvelous insight here about perspective that Jesus looks at our storms differently than we do he has a high he has a heavenly perspective if all we do in our storm is look at the wind is look at the wave is look at the water coming in the boat then that particular storm might get the best of us might get the best of our faith but if we will look to Jesus during the storm, there we find the assurance. There we find the peace. There we find the power and the ability to make it through and maybe even get a little sleep. He had a little sleep in that storm. If you go to verse 40, I want you to notice the word you. He says, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And that's incredible to me. Considering all the good that Jesus had done for relative strangers, and these fellows had been the witnesses, and the aides, and all of that ministry, the helpers, how could the disciples think Jesus didn't care about them? Why in verse 38 they said, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? What a question for Jesus, the son of God. You know, a little while ago we were singing the song that Matt led before communion. And he talked about the sacrifice of the cross. But what was the sacrifice before the cross? That he left the glory of heaven and came here. Don't you care? No one cares more. No one cares more. I think about the wonderful song that Peter led us in. Stronger. Where is the power to overcome? It's in Christ. There is no one who is stronger. He cares. He has power. And he's good. He's good. But I see that in a terrible storm, we may be tempted to question, Jesus, where are you? Jesus, don't you care? And we need to remember to look at Jesus through that time. Oh, he is there and he cares. He has not forsaken them. Be faithful to Christ, disciple. Be faithful to Christ, child of God, because he is faithful to you. He is faithful to his followers. We are encouraged in Hebrews chapter 13. 
And verse number five, that he will never leave us. He will never forsake us. In fact, this is part of learning contentment and the key to contentment. Hebrews 13 verse 5 says, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? Think about that. Christian, you have nothing to covet because of what you have. What you have is the Lord who will never forsake you. What you have is the Lord who is your unfailing helper. That's what you have. And so you don't need to covet what anybody else has. You have more. And you have more in the storm. He knows, he understands, he cares. He has not forsaken you. Though the wind is loud, though they're spraying your face, he has not forsaken you. And he will be there till the storm passes by. Disciple, whatever storm you are facing right now, I want to encourage you to look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. And it might be, as we talked this morning, that you say, well, yeah, I've been going through some storms. I mean, I'm doing my best. I'm trying to follow Jesus and be obedient to him. But i got a real storm in my family, in my marriage. I've got a real storm with my conscience and my career. and I've got a real storm with my, my, my finances and how I'm handling those things or maybe catching up to... Maybe how I didn't handle them well in the past. I, but there's storms. And I'm wondering, where's Christ? There's storms of sudden sickness and tragic death. There's grief in that whole process. I tell you, there's storms. And in a room this size, many people in this pew, I, in these pews, I know there's people with storms of broken hearts right now. And you look to Jesus. You never look away from Jesus to seek him to serve him to trust him with your life and your soul to follow him even in this storm he overcomes and we overcome in him these are things we need to take to heart and bear in mind when we're following Jesus but we find a storm I'll tell you this morning that the storm does not mean you failed to follow Jesus Some storms we only have because we follow Jesus. The storm does not mean Jesus is anything less than or other than the Son of God, the Lord and the Savior. He's not failing and not failing you. The storm reminds us that we are dependent upon Jesus. He never ceases being our Savior. Sometimes it's easier for us to appreciate how other people are dependent on Jesus. Sometimes it's easier for us to appreciate, yeah, other people are mourning, I got to help. Other people are rejoicing, I want to rejoice with them. But then when it's our moment, we need to trust Jesus. The storm dispels our recurring notions of power and control. (laughs) Jesus is the one who has power and control. We must not get confused. And the storm develops our faith in ways that That only the storm can. And so as we go through it, we'll learn and we'll grow and we'll trust in the Lord when you're following Jesus and when you find a storm. If you want to put your Bible away and put your notes away, I appreciate your good attention. I love this little account. And it's not little, it's grand, but it's short, it's brief. (laughs) This brief account in Mark 4 just really speaks to me and been speaking to me lately. Are you a Christian, my friend? Talked a lot about the power of being in Christ and how he overcomes and we overcome in him, but you must be in him. Talked about what disciples are learning, but you must be a disciple to learn from Christ. And so so you have an opportunity and an invitation right now to become a Christian. To confess your faith that Jesus is the Son of God and to be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. We have water ready and clothing ready so that you might be baptized and leave here in Christ, a new creation in him. To know that you're following him. Whatever boat you find yourself, there is the Lord with you. Whatever storm it is, there is the Lord with you. If we can encourage you with any spiritual need or baptize you into Jesus, whatever it may be, we invite you to come forward now so that we stand and sing. Won't you please come?